apologies. Uh, Tamina. Tamina. No, sorry, not Tamina. Sorry, Mamuda. Mamuda, <laughs> me and sorry. I'm I'm so sorry. Don't worry. <laughs> I was trying to sort out the recording button at the same time. <laughs> Don't worry. It's old age, Julie. Um, all right. Declarations of any other business. Declarations of interest in the register or the agenda. <clears throat> Okay, minutes of the meeting of the 8th of November. Any corrections, please? No? Okay. Um, action log and matters arising. I don't think there's anything outstanding unless anyone wants to raise anything. Okay. Right, on to quality section. The first item is uh, the patient story. And I think we're welcoming Helen. Is, is Helen on the call? Yeah, we were going to. Swap. Sorry, we're going. We were going to do the uh, neurodiversity weights item first, but I'm not sure Mary's oh, right. on the call. Yes, yet. no, Mar Mary is so, here. Yes. Okay, oh, she is. I'm sorry. That's fine. Want... Hello, Mary. Welcome. Uh, Tamina, am I handing over to you then? Yes, please. Yes, thank you, and thank you, Mary, for joining. Um, so, as actually, the first thing I'd like to say is I do apologise. The paper was quite long and quite detailed. Um, it is a summary of sort of quite intense work with the team. Um, but what I will do is just a take it as read, and I'll just pull out what I think the main points are that we'd like you to focus on. Really, um, it became clear that the level and extent of the weight um, for autism and ADHD assessment in the under 18s was both unacceptable and I think critically hidden by some challenges with data and reporting. So actually we've had a, quite a piece of work to do to really understand what has been going on, the extent of the weights, and when we describe a weight, what do we mean by that? Um, I think actually the data reporting, I would say, is an issue we've recognised across a number of services, and Paul and I will probably come back to you with another piece of work to look at that in a bit more detail. Um, but I think with the ADHD and autism weights in um, CYPF, we, there, was a, there was a perfect storm, really. So we did see a significant increase in the referrals, particularly for our ADHD pathway. Um, we had some quite critical and um, chronic staffing challenges um, within the service at a number of different levels. We did receive some non-recurrent funding from both um, both parts of so both East and West Berkshire um, for some specific targeted work. I think it's fair to say that our ability to fill the roles that would were required to enable us to meet those targets again has been quite slow and quite challenging. Um, I think it's fair to say, and Mary, I think you will agree, we have some really high standard processes and pathways within our service, but it's probably fair to say that they were unable to keep pace with the sort of demand that we were seeing um, over a period of time. And I think also it's fair to say within community mental health services generally, but particularly in this service, we have had a lack of experience about how we understand and manage waiting lists and backlogs. And again, that's a piece of work that Paul and I will be looking at going forward. So to really try and get, get to grips with this piece of work, um, a, a really early piece of work that Gary Nixon, who's been supporting us, was doing was to try and get some reliable and accurate data about what was really going on. And it's fair to say that took some time. I think, Mary, you're, you're nodding. It's been quite challenging to get that. And then once we get that, to get a really clear trajectory about what we would need to do to get our, our, our um, lengths of weight down to a manageable level. This involved reviewing the whole pathway. Again, I think we were asking clinicians to think very differently about the work that they do and how they do it. And that's taken some time, I think, to get people on board. And I'd like to thank Mary for supporting that work as well. And then out of that, identifying what some of the opportunities were. So one of those is around automating some of those parts of the pathway, which might take a long time, but actually we could do in a different way. And that's one of our early pieces of automation work that we're doing with, um, with Alex's team or with Mark. Looking at benchmarking and sharing good practice with other services, this is a challenge we're seeing across the piece and Mary's worked hard with our Bob Frimley and also our regional colleagues to see what other things and other practices people are putting in place to try and improve the waiting times. Um, we've done a lot of work looking at productivity and skill mixing. So how do we make sure all of our clinicians are working as well and as focused away as they can do? How can we operate with different staff doing different parts of the pathway again so that we can release our more senior and more experienced clinicians to work with our most complex patients? Um, there's been a really specific and, and targeted piece of work around how we recruit to our vacancies. I think we would still say, particularly in our consultant level, which we're still challenged with that. Um, but that's a piece of work that we're focusing on. Um, 
I think where we've got to, and, and sorry, and the other thing we've been doing is we've um, we've allocated some money um, to do a short piece of work with our private providers to pick up some of the backlog work. So we're working with Helios and Psych, um, Psych, Psychiatry UK to do some um, additional weight work with uh, autism and um, ADHD patients as well. So all of those have given us a sense now that we think we're in the position where with our autism weights, we probably have the opportunity to bring it down to 18 and then 12 months and maintain it to that level. And partly that's because with autism, it's an assessment and diagnosis only. There's no ongoing treatment or support. And some of the work that the team's doing at the moment is to make sure information, advice, support and guidance is available to people while they're waiting for their formal diagnosis or assessment. We think with ADHD, it's going to be more challenging. Um, the level of referrals does continue to increase. And of course, the conversion rate from people being assessed to having a diagnosis and requiring titration is relatively high. And once we have people on our caseload, then we need to make sure there's ongoing work with them in terms of the medication review. So that feels like a more challenging um, situation for us to be managing. Um, so I think we have less confidence, is probably worth saying, than we do around the autism weights. So... That's kind of really where we are at the moment. Julia, I don't know if there's anything more that you want to add, because I know you've been doing a lot of work around this and also you've been engaging with the MP who's particularly exercised about this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, we've made a commitment. We'll eliminate two year waits by March 20, end of March 2023. I think that's just really clear statement. I think we need to put on record. So that's that's the uh, intention with autism that looks on track for the reasons you've said that referrals have remained at the level for which we wrote a business case to get them down to 12 months and although there was a spike 12 months ago it's actually gone back to its normal level so the staffing the resources and changes we made will mean that we'll eliminate two years waits by the end of the financial year and providing re uh, referrals stay broadly at that level we would have the capacity in line with the original business case to get down to 12 months adhd has doubled in terms of the referrals coming in compared to the business case. So at the moment, uh, the best we're likely to do is keep it beyond two years. And as a consequence of that, we've met with both uh, integrated care boards, Frimley and Bob recently, explained the situation, they understand that, and we'll have a conversation about what they may want to do about ADHD. But again, aside from the numbers, there is a Obviously, a, a question to ask is, you know, why has ADHD suddenly exploded to the point it's doubled? There is no other element of healthcare. So we hear about pressures in A&E. They haven't doubled anywhere mm. else. So we've got a doubling of, of kind of demand uh, and it, it's not slowing down. So there's something also about what's going on in schools, homes and all the rest of it. And whether indeed, you know, it's the backdraft from the lockdown and actually there may be a settling down at some point. And so the conversation we've had with commissioners is let's get it down to two years. We can look everybody in the eye and say our process is internal, uh, are, are up to scratch. We brought in automation. What what can we do next as the next step? So the, the next landmark is eliminating the two year waits and then having that conversation with uh, our ICB colleagues around uh, ADHD and where we go with that next. Okay. Tamina, have you um, finished? I have finished, yes. I didn't know if there are any sort of questions or, or queries. And we've got Mary here, who's a clinical director for um, CYPFLD, who's um, been very involved in this work and a lot of experience with can this I, particular Can I just um, um, start something off? One of the things we've always, um, where we have pressure on services is about using our staff at the sort of the upper level of their license i think is the phrase isn't it that's uh, so we don't have senior experienced people doing things that a more junior person could do competently uh, I, I i think i think i picked up in the paper and what you've just said that that's sort of part of your strategy here as well is that correct yes absolutely okay and then in terms of the uh, automation do we, do we see with some of these things it looks as though there is an opportunity as a lay person to do quite a bit here and we're you know as a trust we're very uh, blessed by having um uh, the performance of our digital systems to help is that is that going to be a material improvement do you think it sounds like it's only for for the autism assessment anyway is it, but it, does it does it spill across into other aspects of it um or are there other rather waffle question do, do you think there's a real do you think digital automation is a real benefit to solving this problem or is it just one of those things you do which is you know helpful but not not a real driver for solutions 
Can I answer that? I think it has a lot of possibilities because um, the, the first stage is looking at triage, which is at the moment a really paper heavy process. It takes a very long time. It delays the amount of time people get to go through the system to get the support that's offered before they're assessed. Um, also, we end up with kind of a doubling up of information gathering because of the time the process takes at the moment. So it kind of it, it takes time for the people waiting, but it also takes extra clinical time to process it. There's also the possibility going forward of um, exploring decision making trees with AI for the next stage of the autism assessment. So if we get this bit right, we have the opportunity to explore how it can actually shorten the length of the assessment itself. So, so there's lots of opportunities with it, which I think will increase capacity, Martin. Okay, well, Alex is waiting patiently. Thanks, Martin. And just to that point, and we're going to be discussing the digital strategy later in, in committee, um, we've already proven uh, clinical capacity increase through automation and other services through our pilots. So I think we're very excited to see uh, and develop the opportunity going forward. And it's great to hear the service are uh, interested in automation in this particular area to resolve some of the problems. I was just going to ask uh, Tamina around our partnership with uh, the commercial sector in terms of digital providers of assessment and diagnosis and what that looks like in the long term because I think uh, it's brought really important capacity mm. to us in a constrained workforce market. What does the balance look like going forward in terms of how we manage down towards that uh, under two years towards 12 months? Um, I think it's a, it's a really good question. Helios and Psychiatry UK have been very responsive um, in, in enabling us to commission more work from them. I think it's probably worth saying that lots of people are looking to them as an org as organisations and companies which they want to be using because everyone's experiencing the same challenge. I guess the trick for us is being really clear about how we how we use them appropriately. Um, what we're experiencing as well is um, in opening up the additional appointments, uh, we're having some people who are dna or they're opting out and there's something about them understanding the level of support and care and, and the quality of the diagnosis and assessments or assessment diagnosis that they will be getting so i do think there's a broader piece of work we need to be doing around that at the moment i i can't remember how many people are opting out mary but it's higher than we would have expected um, for a number of different reasons so i think there's something about people feeling really confident it's a bit like when you go to the gp and you can see a, a very very competent nurse but people want to see a gp so it makes them feel a bit concerned about the service they're going to be getting i think it's making sure that we develop a really good relationship with them so they don't get kind of pulled and poached and, and pulled in a lot of different directions and getting that mix right so certainly when we talk to the consultants and Minu and I have some really helpful conversations is about where we manage that complexity where people might have autism and ADHD or other things going on and making sure that that level of support and expertise is where we really need it to be so I would say it's still a bit of work in progress um, but I think we have to see the capacity they can offer as being something that needs to be part of our strategy going forward. And a, and a clear part of our model. If we've got confidence yeah. in those providers, then yes. we should we yeah. should share that with our with our patients and families. Yeah, absolutely. We we were a very early adopter of um, using Helios to support our service, so we've got very good relationship with them, and we inputted really into the development of some of their assessment processes because we were able to work with them very early on as well. And we were also able to work with a lot of the local charities in order to, for them to support the process as well, which really helped. Thank you, Mary. Um, Sally. Um, uh, can I say, first of all, I'm really pleased to see this paper because I think this neurodiversity and the huge waiting list is such a a large problem it's almost uh, it, it's almost easy to become sort of you used to seeing it do, do you know and it's a, a, a national picture um but in terms of the actual assessment process have we benchmarked that against other services to see if ours is actually good enough do, do, do you know without being it, it sounds rude but without being cold, gold plated because I have seen that in our other, other 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 services, you know, over the last few years, clinicians have had to actually review the the, the process in relation to the increasing in, increasing demand. And secondly, I'm a deputy chair of a school governors for a primary school, and I just wondered the liaison with the schools, you know, because what they need is the they want the the, the 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 statement, don't they, so that they can provide the. So two years is a long time to then support the child. Um, 
uh, Martin, sorry, if I just come in on the first bit, and then I'll like, also the last bit, and I'll ask Mary to sort of comment on on the first bit. Um, I think it's a really uh, interesting point because it's an absolute misconception that you need a diagnosis to be able to access additional support from the local education authority. Um, and I think that's one of the messages we want to kind of keep putting out. It's worth saying we do have some ambitions around how we work with our voluntary community providers and our um, schools and education around how we manage and develop an approach around the environment for people who are neurodivergent. I think we, we're also really clear that we have to focus on the here and now problem, which is we have extensive weights for people. So the two things we're doing is making sure that we give people access to the kind of information they would get after a diagnosis in any case. I think the challenge with autism is you have your diagnosis and then it's kind of so what and it's still around how you work with your community, your family, and that sort of thing. Um, and there are some really good community development in particularly in West Berkshire, I think Mary, aren't they? Really some really good sort of community groups where people can access some support and then peer support and being and be put in contact with other families who are maybe going through a similar kind of process. But I think a medium to longer term piece of work, it sits with our neurodivergent um, diversity strategy as well, how we kind of create ourselves in the, as an appropriate employer and how we kind of maintain those conversations around what neurodivergence looks like and how we can kind of embrace it within our communities. But the here and now really is about how we can right. kind of get to get yeah. with, this, with this process. And sorry, the gold, the gold plated process, Mary, that you, you'll need to comment a bit more on that. Yeah, and just to add about the other point as well, Tamina, I think it's also a bit of a misnomer that getting a diagnosis means you will get an EHCP as well. Oh, no, yeah. no, no. You know, it, 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 it is ultimately a needs led process. Um, yeah, with, in terms of benchmarking, we recently benchmarked against Oxford and Surrey and Buckinghamshire. So we, we were able to kind of look at all the different aspects and sec sections of our assessments and how long we took on each bit. So if you were going to kind of go time for time, we benchmarked really well in terms of how right. long we take on our assessment. Um, and at the moment, we're working collaboratively with them to look at how we can all look at how we reduce the time that we take, but still have a good quality of assessment. So there might be times where we have to go for a longer assessment because things are more complex. But when things are clearer, are there yes. things that we don't have to do in order to get to the end point because we've got so much information from school and parents, etc. anyway, in the first case. Thank you, Marley. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Thank you, Mara. OK, um, to anything else on this uh, difficult conundrum, because I mean, uh, the demand point that Julian made about, uh, you know, the, the, the doubling, I think it was the figure, if I remember Julian's comment. Uh, I mean, I, I assume that's something nationally that people were looking into to understand what's driving that and, and what the likely length of time is. Um, yes, and we'll it, it, it is, Martin, yeah, although people are, are speculating. I mean, I think I think what we need to be really clear about, Martin, is we've had an initial amount of money. We need to demonstrate the doubling of productivity. That's, you know, we, yeah. the, the, there's some things we can't get hold of, but what we could clearly need to be demonstrating in our trajectory is that we've used the money as wisely as possible and at least, at least doubled uh, our uh, productivity. And that's, that will get us into a good place. And we have confidence about that data. Then we can have perhaps more front foot conversations about, about what next. And that really is the intention. I suggest that we're probably, we pick this up either just in an exec report or something in, in the April board so that we can see have we achieved that landmark of kind of doubling, you know, consistently doubling our productivity, got it into a stable position, had confidence about our data, and then what is the next steps? Because by then we should be able to fill in some of those gaps, Martin. Yeah, I, I certainly think that we should have a report, you know, in the, the early part of, in this case, the spring averages of next year, so we can check that we're, we're succeeding in our plans. Naomi. Yeah, thanks. And Julian, you just prompted a thought, and I, I, I have a sort of vague memory, so forgive me, that the team that we've built here uh, around this particular service is, is relatively new, and we've built it at scale in recent times, I want to say over the last couple of years. And I, so is that right? Yes, it is. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, it was a team probably across Berkshire previously of 28 people, something like that, and it's probably now 50 odd people, including administrators, yeah. something like that. So it's, it's doubled in size effectively um, and in 12 months, actually. Yes. And I and I just wanted to refresh my memory on that because I, I actually think that's quite relevant. And, I, and I'm and i supposing that you guys do, too, because, uh, you know, in any 
in that context, when you build a team at scale, at the, you know, in that in that time frame, purposefully, because you recognise that demand is growing, and you've attracted funds in order to to build that service. Inevitably, it takes a while for for, for it to embed. So I, I feel certain that there'll be some learnings that we've derived from the last sort of twelve month period, and we're putting those into effect. Which goes, I think, to your productivity point. Mm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Okay. Any any other comments or questions? In which case, uh, to me, thank you very much, and to Mary for all your, for the report and all you're doing. It's clearly a challenge, and uh, and I think we look forward to seeing early next year, you know, how things are progressing. And and clearly, it's a, an area for innovation. I think as Naomi was hinting at that, you know, we've got a huge problem. With this, it's a time to uh, really think hard about the way we do business and how we can improve things. And and from what the report says and what you've told us. It's clear that you're doing, you know, you're on track, as it were. You're, you're addressing this with vigour, um, uh, but nevertheless, it's a big, challenging problem. So thank you, and pass on our thanks to your teams, would you? Thank you very much. That's uh, fine. Okay, I'll just start my agenda again. So, if we, is it all right to to go back to um, item six, Julie? Have I anything else to rearrange in the agenda? No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. OK, so we move back to item six, the first item on quality, and it's the patient story. Debbie, can I in ask you to introduce? You can. I'm going to hand straight over to Helen Palethorpe, and it's a story around dental services today that Helen is going to um, take us through. Helen, welcome. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Technology is a wonderful thing most of the time, but it was against me. I'm just <laughs> going to sh share a presentation, if you don't mind, that I've got for it. Um, How long do you think you'll take, Helen? Just about so ten, ten ten minutes. That's fine. That's fine. Well, I say that I talk fast. Depends That's on right. the questions. That's okay. Just as long as it's time for some questions. <laughs> right. It's just loading it at the moment. Can you see? Yeah. Good. Um, so basically, yes, Helen Pale Thorpe. I'm head of Barch Community Dental Service. I'm also a specialist in special care dentistry. Um, I thought I'd give you a brief view. Some may not know who do we treat. We are the only dental service for children who have blind adults who have learning disabilities, physical disabilities, complex medical or mental health problems, elderly, frail and or dementia. And these people will probably stay with us throughout their life as they'll be unable to be seen in general dental practice. We also provide care for children with trauma, complex dental conditions or high decay rates who are uncooperative. They're usually seen for just one course of treatment and discharged back to their own dentist. Um, but our care is very much about, first of all, the right place for that patient, which could be in the dental chair if we're lucky could be in an ordinary chair. We may need to use a wheelchair tipper or a bariatric bench on the lap, the waiting room, at their school, domiciliary care, on the floor or in the car. And it's all down to the individual. The right time of day, which day? When aren't they at a day centre? When can the carer bring them? The time of day with children, it's better earlier, adults later regular visits, trial visits, and often clearing the surgery because you just don't know what people are going to get hold of. So if we look then at the right care, intravenous sedation we can do, inhalation sedation, um, general anaesthetic. Sorry, I'm losing my slides now. Let's go back to it. Reasonable yeah. adjustments is up on the yeah, screen. Yeah, here we go. So, yes, that was all about, sorry, reasonable adjustments with the wheelchair tippers, the domiciliary care. Um, on to our wheelchair tipper fits a bariatric bench, which can take people up to 46 stone, should we need it. Um, we then, what else do we do? Well, we have two dental access centres for the general public. We treat patients at Broadmoor and at Thornford Park and Ravenswood. We're working with the homeless at St Mungo's in Reading and we do epidemiological surveys for five-year-olds. Um, 
achievements I must bring these out really because we're so proud of them. We've been given funding for additional GA sessions for children's extractions and we've managed to reduce our waiting list from 530 two years ago to 108 last month. We've reduced the maximum waiting time from 112 weeks to 20 weeks with only one patient now waiting more than 18. And this wouldn't have been possible without the goodwill of our dentists and nurses who are working additional hours on Saturdays. Um, if you look at core 20 plus five um, with the target populations, you will see in the key clinical health inequalities is oral health. And that's the aim there is to reduce the backlog of children waiting extractions um, for tooth decay. And that's what we've been trying to do. But we've also been successful with our patients that need additional care. Some of our patients can't be treated uh, in the clinic at all and need a general anaesthetic. That's comprehensive care, so we'll do all their treatment in one go. They're very challenging patients indeed, and we have to think outside the box and plan very carefully for it. Um, we work with the families, we work with the carers, and with the learning disabilities coordinators at RBH who are wonderful. Um, we regularly do bloods for these patients. We're very good at cutting nails doing hair if we need to, because sometimes they can't manage that. Uh, the podiatrists come in, ophthalmologist comes in, ENT. We've even had smears done on our list, but alternatively we'll go when they're having a general anaesthetic for another reason to do an examination on them to see if they need treatment. So they could be having an ECG, they could be having an MRI under a general anaesthetic, Gyneop, piles, not so pleasant, or hernias. We've seen it. Um, again, we've managed to reduce our waiting list significantly um, in the two years that we've had funding. And the waiting times from 138 weeks to 50 weeks. That seems a very long time, but we can only see patient, two patients for each session but we've only got 16 waiting for more than 18 weeks. So those that are waiting longer is because we need medical assistance um, or joining it with another operation. So I wanted to just give you a thought of what our feedback we've had positively from our patients. So these are a few examples from I Want Great Care. Um, so someone said, my son saw Minaxi and uh, Diana. Both were very lovely and kind. Saw them working together in harmony as a team providing treatment and they were included in the process fully. Um, another elderly lady said she'd just like to say how pleased her husband was with his new dentures. He lost them whilst he was in RBH. That's another thing we do as well. We work with them to provide dentures when they've lost them in hospital. We do get paid for it but nothing was too much trouble and we had to do it as domiciliary visits. Um, this was another mum. She wanted to say thank you for all the help and support with her daughter's dental treatment. She'd had it under a general anaesthetic. She slept all afternoon and was now eating ice lollies, an angel delight. Perhaps not the ideal food, but never mind. And then another one, we had to go and do a visit at a school because we couldn't get him into the clinic. And the father said how much he thanked us for visiting. Oh, I shouldn't have put the patient's name, sorry. I'll move on from that. But visiting in the school. So we do it in the situation that's appropriate for them. Again, we've had achievements in reducing our referral waiting lists. As you can see, that shows the big creep up was April 20 when from the grey line you'll see we had very few referrals because of course dental practices were closed for three months but the waiting times went up dramatically and we've managed to get those down again. Learning, well we do have some interesting things happen in the dental service as you'll probably know from the incidents we have. Recently we've actually had two incidents of people swallowing foreign objects 
One was under sedation, where we had a small pad in the cheek which absorbs saliva to help us work, um, and they managed to swallow it. So we had to look at the kosh for that product. Fortunately, it's non-toxic. There were no ill effects at all. Another patient with learning disabilities, the dentist was removing the root of a tooth and it flicked out and the patient went down the throat. We were fairly sure the patient had swallowed it, but we need to send them for a chest x-ray to check. Fortunately, all was OK. But those two incidents came very close together within a month and they involved experienced dentists, but it realized, made us realize that we really needed a standard operating procedure for incidents such as this, um, which we're now arranging. Um, so that was one. Another one was our dental access centres. Um, we provide emergency care for the general public at Tilehurst and at Upton Hospital. And pre-COVID, it was a walk-in service at Upton, but obviously we've not been able to reinstate it as a walk-in service. And we've had to change to booked appointments. But there were morning sessions. The triage for them started at nine o'clock. So there was time wasted before the first patient arrived and fewer treat patients were able to be treated during the sessions. So we worked with the commissioners about changing the time. And what happens now is the triage is done centrally in the morning. And that's where telephony has helped us a lot, actually. And we've moved the treatment sessions to the afternoon at both sites. So we book the appointments in the morning, giving the patients time to get there for their afternoon appointment. Our last learning really from this time recently is that nothing is impossible, um, which is very nice. We had some patients on our special care waiting list who were just too difficult to do. We tried everything. I, One of them, for instance, I'd been out to the care home. We trialled sedation at the home. That had no effect at all. The anaesthetist, anaesthetist had been out to see what they could do. Nothing was effective. And we were just stymied and trying to work through another plan. But having been able to do these additional sessions on a Saturday now, we're working in a different theatre complex in South Wing. There's less, ac it's easier access for people. We're not passing the shops. And we have had patients with learning disabilities dive into Marks and Spencers and eat the food when they're meant to be starved and we've had to cancel them off the list. It's much quieter on a Saturday and we can use alternative sedation op options because of the nearness to theatres. Um, it's been a great success and three of the ones that were most difficult to do have now been treated, but it couldn't have happened without support of the team at RBH. And I have to say their anaesthetic teams and recovery teams have been so good and the learning disability coordinator. So thanks to them as well for that. Future, what are we looking at? We're looking to improve the recall system for our continuing care patients. We've been concentrating on reducing the referral waiting list, but we need to improve support for the, our vulnerable patients and ensure they're seen regularly. We're working with St Mungo's charity in Reading at the Caversham Road site. They've set up um, shipping containers as pods for 40 people to try and integrate them back into society. But one of their problems is access to dental care because they have a high treatment need. So we were starting to work with them. Um, for us, the, all the community dental services in the southeast of England were meant to go out to tender many years ago, and it's been delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, it's still being delayed because commissioning has changed from NHS England to the ICBs. But the, we know full well that the lot sizes will change and we won't have a contract for Berkshire. We will have a contract for the Thames Valley, which will be with Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire. We decided a long time ago we weren't going to fight each other over it um, and have winner takes all. We would work together and we're putting together a partnership agreement so we can work with common pathways 
um, and get better care for our patients. Um, so I'm hoping that will be a great success. That's all it was. I don't know how long it did take, Martin. It was perfect, um, Helen. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Can, can you stop sharing so we can see uh, all the faces? I can do. Yeah, uh, I think I can do. It does not like me stopping it. Sharing. Sorry. Oh, Come there on. I go. Yep, yeah, I've done it. Done it? Yep. That's it. Back, perfect. Back Thank normal. you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> we've got some we've got some questions, Helen. And I have to say, uh, whenever I visit you and your team, it's always a pleasure to, to see everyone. It's a, a great team. And I always feel a bit nervous. You're going to put me in the chair and do something to my teeth, but you haven't so far. So Well, I'm right. actually in the middle of a staff whole day staff meeting is each Ham East Hampstead at the moment. I've oh, taken off my Christmas jumper because I knew this was going to be recorded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Mark. Yeah, Helen, thanks ever so much for a really fascinating uh, presentation. I do have to um, share my ignorance. I hadn't appreciated the breadth of services and the yeah. the people that you reach. So I found it particularly interesting. Thank you. The, the environment that your team are working in is very challenging compared to normal dental services. What impact does that have in terms of your ability to retain and also recruit into the team? Because as you said in your presentation, you are so dependent on the quality of the people that you have. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's an interesting one that you'd think we'd have a high turnover, but there's no doubt that working in the community dental service is a vocation for most of our staff. And once they arrive with us, they don't leave unless Occasionally, unfortunately, they go off and have a baby or the family has to move for some reason. And the only other reason we lose them, unfortunately, is because we're getting non-recurrent funding rather than recurrent funding. And people come to the end of their fixed term contract and they'd all like to stay on. We're so lucky. We have a great team. Great team. Oh, thank you. That's good to hear. Thank you, Mark. Sally. Um, Helen, my, my, my question was very similar to Mark's because I think that the, your type of service, the work you do with um, people with learning disabilities, it, it's a little gem, isn't it? Because some of the people are, 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 are shall we say, a, a little challenging. And what I was going to ask, which was similar to Mark, is I know um, staff in your type of service sometimes know people, as you said quite rightly, over a lifetime and mm. continuity is really important, isn't it? They know who's coming in, they know their ways, they have a relationship with them. So th that's essentially what I was going to ask, whether you actually are able to sort of retain, re retain staff so that you're able to provide that type of continuity, which is so important to lo mm. lots of these client groups. Oh, yes, we can. And we have no problem recruiting either. But one of the beauties, as you say, I think, with our service is the fact it's almost birth to death. We don't lose them in transition at the age of 16 um, to other, as some other services may do. So we're very lucky like that. Yes, that, that, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Julian. So it goes without saying what a fantastic services as we, we, we saw that uh, ourselves but I want to pay tribute to, to, to Helen's leadership and mentality because when in, in, during Covid when when they saw the waiting lists go up they sort of weren't overawed by it but they just became the ultimate networkers kind of reaching out to the two acute trusts finding different ways actually mm -hmm. raising the profile of it and sort of you know they, they weren't it's almost giving them a second a new lease of life and I just I just think that was incredibly impressive about how they pretty much under their own steam because of their leadership and because of their their staffing is, is good that they managed to tackle their problems themselves and we did a bit of unblocking at a senior level but they did the vast majority of that themselves which is a tribute to the kind of local leadership really and a bit of an exemplar really about how how teams can really be innovative uh, when they've got the right leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if I can take this opportunity to say in fact, because I am retiring soon, um, that actually we couldn't do this with this out the support of the exec board. I do I know I go and stalk people occasionally, Alex. Um, but 
without the support of the exec board and the other services as well, you know, contracts, finance, HR, IT, and people like that. They've been so supportive of us all. Helen, thank so, you very much. I think we must all formally record our best wishes to you for your retirement and thanks for what you've done. And certainly I, I've seen it firsthand. And, uh, you know, the reduction in waiting times and the relationship with our partners in the health system and also across the ICB, which is uh, which is excellent. So oh, thank I, you. To, thank you to your teams and uh, enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> Will do. I'll we'll get back to my staff meeting. Yeah, then. thanks so much. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> OK, that was very good. Um, now, screen to speak up. Mike, you're on the call. Yes, good morning. Martin. Morning, everyone. Mike, Mike, this is a very important topic and, and we've read your report, but the thing that I always and, and there's a trust we do pretty well on this. So it's, you know, it's mm. not a, a sort of a fire we're fighting, but I always sort of find it difficult to identify myself. What are the key thing that we actually need to do, you know, specific thing we need to do to to reach some of those groups of staff who are still more reluctant uh, to take part in the process? Are you able to? To help with that, or or shall we just take questions? Um, um, you know, it's, it's some it's free. I, I find it difficult. You know, I, I don't have to have something specific. You know, if we only did this, then we think we solved this problem or, or moved it forward. So I I always find it quite difficult to identify. It's probably my weakness, Mike. But uh, can you help? No, so so I've I've been asked several times. Um, what are the barriers to certain groups of staff? Um, speaking up whether it's to me or or through any other route i don't have a a crystal ball so yeah. i i went and asked them so specifically the race quality network um i've been in pretty heavily engaged with them over the last six months or so and have directly asked those questions what are the barriers and if you look in the executive summary there they are listed, you know, it's around culture. Um, maybe that's something that is not within our gift to 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 change somebody's uh, cultural heritage and how they were brought up, how they were. Um, they may or may not speak out about things, but questions on uh, language. So they're talking about complaining. Well, freedom to speak up isn't making a complaint. It's um, reporting that that something is is done. Past experience, um, questions around confidentiality, and you know, do I go and talk to Julian about each and every individual, and they're all named, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are the sorts of barriers that they are talking about, um, and that is preventing them from coming forward and talking about uh, whatever it is that um, they're experiencing that um, that is that is negative and it's quite clear that they talk amongst each other and um, certainly I know of two or three instances whereby um, staff have been discouraged from by other colleagues of coming forward to talk about issues um, because they feel it'll do you no good and you'll be in a worse position um, than, than you would otherwise. Hence why I've sort of spoken about detriment as well uh, and how we can minimise the risk to staff that, um, that do talk out, that, that, that do come and speak to me or, or through any other other way. So um, whether that shines a light for you, Martin, I don't know, but, but that uh, is. Uh, I think it's a really important issue and it's one which I suspect uh, it needs more than just a simple uh, one prong approach. Yeah, and we sure. have a chance to talk about in part two of the meeting some of these issues a bit more. Uh, Alex. Mike, thanks for your report. Uh, and I know firsthand you provide superb support as in your role as freedom to speak up guardian to to our colleagues and i just wondered if there was an opportunity to profile anonymously or people wanted to um show themselves to the positive experience that people have with your support and, and the system and the process 
that you manage extremely well. I, just as a, a mitigation to some of those uh, concerns and cultural aspects, probably not for answering now, but I do wonder if there's a way we can profile the benefit of uh, the freedom to speak up process in terms of outcomes was, was my first point. And then my second point was just reading into your executive summary. Um, you, you rightly highlighting the behavioural aspects uh, as, as distinct from the patient safety, patient experience aspects of freedom to speak up and the detriment point you've just mm. raised. And I'm kind of really keen to support the process improvements, which I think you're driving at in, in that executive summary. I just wondered what your thoughts were around the process improvements um, that we could take forward and support with. Thanks. Well, so for the first, um, to cover the first point, that's work in progress. I'm I'm speaking to Sanya as chair of the Race Quality Network about um, what can we do to profile success stories uh, where members of the network have come forward and have had a positive experience, um, whether that's kept locally within the network or I bring it to uh, next board. That's um, I, I can easily do that. Um, and then in terms of the, the processes, so I'm, again, I'm currently working with HR colleagues to see what we can do to minimise time delays, to ensure that people have all the right information, what is expected from the organisation, what is what input does that individual need to make into the process to help with that. Um, sort of, I suppose, holding the, the, the organisation to account, which is part of it, um, so that everyone plays their part to minimise the risk to that to that individual. So there will be some sort of uh, written contract or pledge or whatever that we will give to people so they know um, the process because just talking to them can be they can be in quite a high motive state, don't necessarily retain all that information. So that's what we're doing um, at present. That's really helpful, Mike. So to give a bit more visibility and transparency to the process and the outcomes, yeah. as and importantly, as distinct from any kind of formal HR process, because that is that is the power and value of freedom to speak up. Um, so it, it sounded like delays were were perhaps one of the one of the issues we need to think about in terms of process improvement. Thank you. Yeah, and it has to be workable as well. We obviously can't promise things mm. we can't deliver on. Thank you. Tamina. Um, yes, thank you, Mike. So I've I've been working with Mike quite closely over the last few months. I think one of the things I'd observe, Mike, is that people do feel very safe and have confidence in you and the way that you kind of manage and respond to their concerns. But of course, that's something that we need to be developing over time. And, and as people tell stories about how that felt for them, they are likely maybe to to reach out to you where they might not have done previously. I suppose a couple of things for me is, is what more do we need to do as we respond to those concerns? It's that kind of so what question. Someone's come to you. They've had a really helpful conversation. Are, are we doing enough to respond to those concerns and do something about it. And as we review our sort of leadership and management development support, as we sort of go into 2023, is there anything we should be doing within within that sort of development opportunity to maybe deal with some of those behaviours you're describing and maybe try and help people more likely to be resolving or, or managing some of their concerns? I, I think a lot of it is um, for the executive board to support the process when going out on uh, Gemba visits, etc. Um, some form of reassurance that um, where we make um, pledges or promises that we will deliver on that, but it has to be sort of reasonable, I, I suppose. And then to answer the other bit, I, there is there's clearly work to do around awareness of bullying and harassment, um, the microaggressions, those basics that I think we should be um, tackling um, on our route to be to becoming a, an anti-racist organisation. You know, it's sort of like the foothills um, before we meet, we reach the summit or whatever. Maybe a bad analogy, but that's how, <laughs> that's how I see it. 
Thank you very much. And as I said, we, we'll be discussing some of this in part two of the meeting. So, Sally. Um, Mike, thanks for a, a very comprehensive um, re re report. And you've clearly got very strong uh, relationships with the Race Equality Network. Um, uh, can I just clarify the structure? There's you and then there's some speak up champions. And so we, whether you sorry, sorry, I'll carry just, on, carry on. Sorry. And, and, and I was just then going to ask whether you, whether uh, whether you've picked up that sometimes people want to talk to somebody who looks like them and whether you know that we've got diversity at the sort of champion level, if that if that's what we've got. So we are in the process of um, reviewing the champions and relaunching that scheme. So that will take place in January. And I have worked with all the networks to ensure that they will be uh, made fully aware of what we're looking for in terms of um, geographical diversity and any other type of diversity so that anyone within the network has a good chance of applying for any of the 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 posts that will be available albeit their their volunteer volunteering post so we will hopefully then end up with a cohort of champions that matches the diversity of the organization in terms of um the guardian um I'm, I'm chair of the Southeast region of, of Guardians, and this discussion has come up. Should there be um, various Guardians within an organization that people can go to? And the BAME Guardians within that region quite clearly have said, no, that's a sticking plaster. Um, it's, it doesn't change culture. Um, but, it, you know, if, if there is someone there, that people can go to initially that they would rather speak to, then that's fine. Right. So that's the Thank end. You. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. Debbie. I just wanted to answer some of Tamina's question in terms of leadership. So um, Mike and what we do from Freedom Speak Up sits as part of our safety culture steering group and part of our overall look at, across the organisation around culture and absolutely is feeding into our new leadership offer in terms of all of the things that we want to be doing around culture in general, which impacts positively on freedom to speak up, but also the listening up part, which is really important because it's all very well speaking up. But if we haven't got people listening up and following up, then there's no point and it will stop people from speaking up. So it's very much included as part of our overall umbrella safety culture work that we're doing. Hey, thank you very much, Devin. Um, well, well, thank you, uh, Mike. It's, uh, I mean, this is a really important topic, but it's vital. And if we look at examples of where things have gone wrong elsewhere in, in the NHS. You know, lack of freedom to speak up is usually somewhere at the core. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and and although the trust is doing very well we, on this matter, we can't be complacent. Um, so I think the things that you talked about are really important, and I know it sounds as though they're already uh, being actioned. But sort of clear statement from I think the top that we're really serious about this because there are times when when you think you've said it and people haven't understood and haven't got that reassurance and then I think this positive examples of uh, of things that I think Debbie commented on this I think is also really important so people can see something that somebody's raised something something's happened it's been a success it hadn't been detriment to them uh, and the more you do that the more the sort of reassurance that the process is is a, is a proper one and people have confidence in it. So I welcome that. And of course, Debbie's point about learning, there's no point in doing this unless we learn from it. So, uh, but um, I think I just want to add at the end, really, Mike, to thank you. I know you're very committed to this agenda uh, and we're very grateful for that. So thanks for all you do. Well, thank you very much for your support. It's Not appreciated. At Not at all. Okay, um, can we then uh, move on? Um, you're right. We've done that one. Executive report. We just uh, do this as normal. Any questions for Julian? Questions? I guess. I guess Martin. The the, the, the big one here is that potentially the the, the Hewitt review. Um, 
the terms of reference have come out for this. Um, it is uh, quite early on in the uh, it, with the introduction of integrated care boards to so look at the kind of structure. Uh, I mean, I think it is fair and not particularly contentious to say that we've got quite a crowded governance structure in the NHS at the moment. NHS England, the regional teams still uh, exist and obviously integrated care boards and for us and for, you know, for providers sort of wanting to do things, uh, you know, there's many more layers than there were if you go back, you know, just a decade or so ago, significantly more. I think integrated care boards have also raised the issue around, you know, finding their feet. I think there's two things in the Hewitt review, really. Um, it's about accountability and autonomy, uh, you know, how much they have around that. I think very much around, I think, wanting to focus much more on outcomes and outputs than, than plumbing and wiring, because there's still a lot of, uh, around that. And I think, you know, there's, a, I think, an aspiration amongst the integrated care boards, of which obviously Patricia Hewitt is a, a chair of one, that, that the landscape will get less crowded. My own observation is that actually that the integrated care boards themselves are quite new and they themselves have created a level of governance and structures that also need looking at. So I'm, I'm hoping it will not just be an, a, a look at the rest of the structures, but integrated care boards will be able to do that. And I think that is a decisive moment for them, uh, whether they actually uh, end, up, end up being predominantly regulators or predominantly integrators. And at the moment, they're sort of in danger of sort of going more towards the former than the latter, which is their original intention. So I know, Martin, you've been engaged. You may want to say a little bit about it. But again, I think Catherine McDermott's pulling a response back to the, the trust to really try and explain what it's like, particularly for us in two ICBs, uh, and see if we can make some improvements on the current current structure, which is it's just too complicated uh, and not agile enough. Thank you, Julian. I guess to add a couple of things, I've... Um had the opportunity through two of the um, NHS and Federation and NHS providers meetings uh, to join Patricia Hewitt when she's presented to the groups and to actually input into those discussions. And um, my feeling is that um, the words she's saying are very positive. I think it's uh, it's going to be interesting. She, I think she got a report on the 16th of December, her initial findings. Uh, and then full report early in January, but it was a sort of positive, an open uh, uh, approach she's taking to try and understand how to get better outcomes with less bureaucracy, or, you know, for the money that's available. So, uh, and whilst bringing everyone on board, so I th it felt it felt good, and the opportunity to contribute was very welcome. So, um, I've only got one other thing, by the way, on the report, which is just about the low COVID take up in is it West Barks. Deb, are you able just to comment on that? I'm more worried about the low take up of the flu vaccine, if I'm honest, Martin. Okay. Well, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you just comment on the take vaccination take up? Yeah. So, so obviously, with with the COVID, it relies on staff letting us know if they've had elsewhere, and and we have seen um, some vaccine fatigue, to be honest with you, where staff have already had three vaccines, and this is this is a fourth one. Um, they're seeing it doesn't prevent you getting COVID, it might prevent you being more seriously ill, but but encouraging people to have the fourth COVID vaccine or the fifth sometimes if you're more immunocompromised has been a challenge. And um, for the same reason, so, so has flu. You know, we haven't seen flu really in the country for the last couple of years, and I think people have forgotten what it can be like. Um, so it is much harder work than usual. Um, encouraging staff to take up either of the vaccines this year. But we are continuing. We're just about 50% now with our flu vaccine, which is still nowhere near where I would I would want it to be, um, but continuing to encourage. Okay, thanks for that. Any other questions for the, on the report? OK, now then, um, I've been reminded that I missed out the quality uh, committees, minutes, etc. I'm sorry, it's a moving around the agenda it fooled me this morning. Sally, do you want to speak uh, to 6.2, the minutes and the learning from deaths and the garden of safe working? Uh, um, and we can just uh, go through them quickly and take any questions. Yeah, yes, of, of course. So the unconfirmed minutes of the 29th, we had a very good presentation 
on um, a, a QI programme around inpatient falls. And I think that did demonstrate the effective use of a QI and particularly, and Julian made this point that around um, a, a senior or central authority, but uh, local empowerment and it was uh, local empowerment was definitely key to the success of, of that particular pro um, pro project. Um, we, the, the quality concerns and we might want to go say a little bit more. Well, Debbie is going to say a little bit more. I've seen her report uh, around the particular quality concern around um, mental health um, community teams. I, I won't say any any more than that. And I know, Tamina, you weren't unfortunately able to be at the, the quality committee, but you know there was some discussion around that. Uh, a view that the board needed to be cited on on that particular issue and it's going to come back to the committee i think in may 2023 um we the ongoing issue of the of the uh, patient incident res response framework which will constitute a, a cultural change and we're going to have a presentation of the board around that because it's very important that you know there's board leadership around that um, and, and apart from that i will uh, take the the minutes as read and would be very happy to take any any questions in terms of the guardian of safe working hours i have to say it, 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 it there's absolutely nothing to report on that um and and then le learning from 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 deaths you will see from the the report there that there uh, uh, the high proportion of the deaths are actually as uh, as as um was pointed out are end of life de deaths there's, there's no lapses of care um uh, and and there there was uh, there are are no um I I issues of concern for for the committee but very happy to take questions thank you sally my apologies again for missing you out um uh, having read the the minutes in detail uh, there's obviously a very the, the committee is working i think sounds very well focusing on key issues and getting beneath the surface so thank you to you and, and the members and the exec any questions OK, in which case I will try and now move on to the next correct item, item eight, Paul, finance. Thank you, Martin. Um, so uh, again, I assume the report is read and I'll just pull out some of the uh, some of the key items. So obviously um, month eight, we broke even in the month, um, which means we continue to track um, better than plan. So year to date surplus of 100,000, so 800 better than anticipated this time of the year. Um, in terms of the overall finances, it's looking relatively stable this month. Um, income a little bit higher than expected, and what we're starting to see is uh, recognition of elective recovery funding um, coming through, and that will play through till the end of the year. So this is the money that we'd secured from Bob um, that was related to increases in activity levels over and above the threshold set pre-COVID. Um, we are actually tracking above those thresholds, which is really positive, which means we're on track to retain that money. Equally, the centre have taken away um, the risk of any clawback of that funding nationally. So we'll expect the full elective recovery funding as planned, which will be four million by the end of the year to bleed in over the next um, over the next four months. Um, two key variables that are probably going to track through till the end of the year. So in terms of pay, um, obviously following last month's increase reflecting the pay award going in, we've returned back to kind of normal trend level. You can see that on the trend charts. Um, pay did blip um, as 100,000 overspent in the month overall. Um, but there was a one off in there around clinical excellence awards, which we, we we make the payment annually as a one off rather than on a monthly basis. So um, if you exclude that, we were about 200,000 underspent on pay. And obviously we know that we recognise there's a, a planning issue around our um, plans in terms of setting substantive and temporary staffing positions. So overall, overall to plan, but a, a, a big underspend on substantive offset by um, non-permanent staffing spend. Um, other thing probably to know is out of area placements, which October um, showed a quite dramatic rise from an average of 25 placements to 30 and costs increasing to 900,000 in the month. We've closed um, the November position 
And if we look at the number of oaks that we've got currently as of today, numbers have fallen back and we're actually um, at about 18 beds at the moment. We've been holding at about 20 for the last couple of weeks. So we'll start to see that financial benefit um, come through over the next couple of months. And those numbers are aligning to a revised contract position we've taken on extra beds that we've purchased to guarantee capacity and price over the winter period. Um, cash again looks really good. Um, 63.2 million year to date, which is well ahead of plan. That's predominantly been driven by income that we've received, which we're holding pending costs being incurred and slippage on this year's capital programme. And just to remind the board holding that level of cash, um, we are seeing two benefits. One, it's offsetting our PDC costs and two, it's increasing the amount of interest that we've earned, obviously, with the increasing rates this year uh, for the first time in quite a while. We're earning sizable levels of interest on those cash balances and they're offsetting the increase in finance charges that we, we got through the increase in valuations at the end of the last financial year. And just to close on capital, um, we are three million behind our plan year to date. But I think as I indicated to board last month, um, our our major estate programmes in terms of head office, um, MSK accommodation in Newbury and our new facility in Windsor are all expected to be completed by the end of this financial year, which will bring us broadly up to plan and where we've got IT under spends at the moment, um, that's a phasing and majority of the kit replacement will come through over the next couple of months. So we're confident that we will spend to our CDL limit. Happy to close then, take any questions. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I, there's an update, are we taking that in part two? Yeah, there's a there's an update on forecast um, that's in okay. part two. That's all right, thank you. Any questions? I mean, it looks, Paul, as though um, it, you know, in a complex world, things seem to be being managed sensibly. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Um, yeah, it's a fair assessment. I always use the uh, the swan analogy, Martin. It looks looks serene on the outside. We're, we're paddling furiously underneath to manage what is a, a lot of complex moving parts as we head into the end of the financial year. But um, I think we've got a good we've got a good line of sight on where we're going to finish. Thank you. Naomi is going to uh, illuminate us. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I just have a, a fairly detailed question, actually, Paul, so forgive me. Uh, on page 103 of the pack, uh, there's a sentence right at the bottom that there says the trust has submitted a bid against the public sector decarbonisation scheme. Yeah. A bit more on that sounds intriguing. Yeah, so this is to um, re replace uh, the majority of the boiler works at um, West Barks Community Hospital. So it's um, we've submitted the bid. It went in last month. We will find out at the end of March whether we've been successful. It's a it's an intriguing bidding round. They open the window at two o'clock in the afternoon, and it's a first come first serve basis. So um, health and education and other public sector bodies are all sat around PCs at two in the afternoon frantically trying to get the bandwidth to get the bids in. So I think ours landed at about 10 past two by the time it finished downloading. Got no idea where that sits nationally in terms of um, what landed first. Good luck. OK, in which case, Paul, thanks very much. Can we then move on to the performance report? Uh, yeah. Uh, again, I'll assume as read and just pick up a few uh, few highlights. So uh, if you just look at the breakthrough um, objectives, um, just first one I'd like to highlight is falls, where the number of 15s, um, the lowest we've seen over the past year, which I think in the context of bed occupancy levels across the community wards is really, really positive. Um, and if you look at the chart on page 112, you can really see the work that the, or the impact the work has had in terms of that trend line really coming down. Um, I think I've said this before, but worth reminding the board, we got the September community benchmarking report recently, um, and we are 33% below national average. So even though performing well nationally still continues to be a significant level of focus for us. Um, Self-harm again was a, a good month in terms of numbers compared to previous months. And again, just Reminder that obviously this is um, 
this is an indicator that can be very much influenced by individual patients and over half of the incidents this month um, were down to to one individual um, on one ward who was particularly challenged. Um, if we look at just a couple of the other indicators as well that just give an indication of pressures we're under at the moment, um, I've already said occupancy on community health wards is high, um, so over 87% and obviously mental health wards even higher at 97% um, and of delayed transfers of care, um, community health really seen an increase in terms of the number of delays um, in October with numbers at 18.5% and mental health again con continuing with higher than planned or targeted numbers at 9.6%. Nationally, um, additional funding has been released um, to support delayed transfers and for local authorities to put care packages in place. Um, and we've had assurance that mental health and community services should see the benefit of this. So it isn't just care packages releasing capacity from acutes. Um, we, you know, they have been told that they do need to look at mental health and community services as well. So um, we'll be monitoring that over the next couple of months and that funding is going to be made recurrent, which is really positive. Um, I'll finish there, Martin. Take any questions. Thank you, Paul. Karina. Um, yes, it's it's probably less of a question, really. It's just a, a couple of observations on the occupancy rates and length of stay. I think it's probably fair to say, and I know Debbie, Debbie and I have gone around the loop on this a few times, when we are in a situation with the level of pressure we have in our acute trusts, it's quite difficult to maintain a sort of below 88% occupancy rate on our community wards. And it may well be that we want to look at an average across the year, recognising there'll be times of high pressure. Um, the length of stay we've seen increase significantly in the east, which is a shame because the flow there has traditionally been extremely good. And we've had most recently about 35 percent of our beds were occupied by people waiting um, for discharge. So I know that a lot of work is going on in both of the ICBs to make sure that the new social care package does equally support patients coming out of mental health and community health facilities as well. Um, in mental health, Teresa is introducing a new process with our local authority colleagues around flagging and having the same, um, I, I suppose, overview and scrutiny of people waiting for discharge in their mental health beds as well, um, in the sort of the same level that we would have in our community beds also. Um, I think also with it, the, the final thing is we, we will be bringing a paper early in the new year about the range of things we're doing around the bed optimisation and mental health, but also considering what more we need to do with our community health beds as well, so the board get real oversight of the range of activities that are underway um, in both of those areas. Thank you, Tamina. Sally. Um, this is a question for either Deb Debbie or Minu. Uh, have you are you beginning to get increasing concerns around uh, Campion? And I'm, I just say that in terms of, you know, I, I've looked at the assaults and then there are other issues there around, I think, interpersonal relationships and possibly restrictive practices it, and, and, and perhaps this is it's just uh, it's just a, a, a misperception on my my part but you know when you start seeing a, a particular area being reported in, in with different in different it, it, within different areas sort of adversely whether there is a increasing concern around camping particularly given the nature of the client group I can come in on the specific aspect of that question, uh, Sally. Um, yesterday I was at the Restrictive Practices Intervention Group and where Campion was represented. And uh, we didn't see anything there which raised concern that they were um, out of what we would consider as uh, appropriate uh, uh, use of force. There has been one complaint which is being investigated further uh, which 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 originated uh, there, but apart from that, um, we haven't got any other indication. I'll let Debbie fill in the rest uh, and then come back if required. Th thank you. I mean, in in terms of the um, assaults against staff, um, it tends to be um, related to one individual patient, Sally, and we do see that um, peak and trough. And what we found using QIRF from Campion Ward is that actually very bespoke individual care plans are needed on, on that ward um, 
which has a maximum of nine patients, um, as opposed to any wide scale kind of board based um, interventions, because it tends to be very, very person specific. I, I don't have any any additional, it, it, you know, it, it's a unit that is um, we always keep an eye on. <laughs> Um, I don't have yes, I don't yeah, have yeah, any absolutely. I don't have any initial concerns from anything that's coming forward at, at the moment. Um, it's a unit that we all visit on a fairly regular yes. basis as well. So, well, well, thank you for that. That, that you know, that's that's a, 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 it certainly gives me some assurance. Thank you, Sally. Naomi. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, uh, just picking up on on some of your observations there, Tamina, and. Uh, your comment that uh, you'll bring a, bring a paper forward with regards to bed occupancy. And I think my, my thoughts are gravitating towards a pretty sort of high level here. So it, and it's a bit of a request, but for to be considered, which is, that you know, this has had a lot of media attention, hasn't it? We've all been kind of, uh, you know, you can't you can't not tune into the news and see uh, piled up ambulances outside acute hospitals and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm I, su I suppose I'm describing it in that context. So I think for us, this is this is about the you know our our response and 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 it's sitting within that context. So how are we doing from an ICB perspective? Because we can't look at this in isolation. We can't look at this as a as a trust uh, defined issue or problem. Uh, it has to be viewed from an ICB perspective, and in particular. I guess the big question mark in my mind is in our jurisdiction, what are, what are you know, what, what really are the choke points? Uh, because we're led to believe from the media that it's all to do with social care as being the sort of end of the end of the of the value chain, so to speak. Forgive the vernacular. That was that was clunky. Um, but that's my request. I think I think, Tamina, when you bring this back to mm -hmm. the board to see it in, in that in that uh, from that purview. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, no, it does. Yes. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Sally. Any other questions? OK, in which case, thank you very much. Um, can we move on then to, uh, I think it's Jane. That's right. People, strategies and equalities, diversity, and inclusion, important topic. Jane, are you, are you, oh, Alex, I think he's going to open this. Are you, Alex? Uh, yeah, but Jane's going to take the, the item. So we, we've got update here. It, there's a lot of work going on to, to try and address the workforce challenges we're, we're facing, in particular uh, turnover, which I'm glad to say has reduced now below 17%, and I hope we're on a downward trend. Jane and team have been doing a lot of work to understand the drivers of our retention and turnover, and there is some clear uh, areas of work we can start to get our improvement approach into. It's a lot about career progression, giving people the opportunity and reason and purpose to stay with us uh, and to streamline an experience around career development and progression in the organisation. Flexibility always is a is a key and critical driver. And so I'll just ask Jane to speak a little bit about that rapid improvement event uh, that we had around turnover. And then on the EDI, quality, diversity, inclusion side, we want to start looking at uh, our anti-racism commitment and approach, which is uh, very much more explicitly stepping into anti-racist action as we have done so in Prospect Pass Hospital and seen some very good impact in terms of experience of staff and patients uh, in doing so. We're starting to scope moving that approach into community services. We're going to have a conversation with the board about uh, anti-racism commitments later on. But those are the two things I'd highlight before asking Jane to, to come on in. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm conscious of time um, and I don't want to repeat what's already in um, papers, but so is there a, uh, I really like to open it up to to questions or um, any concerns that uh, people have got from the papers, really. Um, yeah, that's, and, that's that's fine. Is there is there any particular things you want to? I mean, to, like we've read the we've read the the, yeah. the presentation, and it's very clear actually. But are there any particular things you want to raise? Although I have some questions, I'm sure colleagues do. Yeah. Well, um, so certainly a hot off the press. Um, uh, we have found that our, our last um, our last month's uh, turnover figures have gone down 
which is good news. So it's down now to 16.5%, which is quite a significant move, actually. Um, again, um, yeah, we are putting a lot more effort into retention. Um, we do now um, offer an independent interview, for example, to everybody who is leaving the organisation, and that's helped us to save a couple of staff. Um, and we are looking at ways we, we can reach out to staff more, more proactively to hold on, on, on to people. Um, but those are I think the main points I've tried to bring out in the presentation here and, you know, I, again, I, as I say, conscious of time, don't want to repeat too, too much. Okay, here. That's, that's fine. It's a really important topic. Perhaps I'll just start off and I'm sure Colin will come in. Um, just on the retention uh, thing, where do staff go that leave us? OK, um, really interesting, actually. Um, uh, they tend to go to th um, three places. They go to Frimley, they go to Oxford Health, and they go to Royal Barks. But actually, we take more staff from those um, those providers than we lose to those providers. Our biggest um, source of um, exit seems to be that we lost 300 staff um, last year who said they didn't go to another job. So there's 100 who retired and 200 who just said they weren't going to another job. So if we're looking at um, when we were looking at the rapid improvement event and um, we came out with um, a couple of key areas and I think the most critical of those is to look at excessive working hours. That was one of the ones that came out. It's shown up several times ever since I've been looking at the staff survey as something that stands out um, for us that we have um, very high number of people complaining about excessive working hours um, and that's a, a piece of A3 work that we're going to have a look at um, specifically at the moment. Uh, you, know, you know, are those 200 leaving because they've got caring commitments, children, maybe um, family, um, or is it that they're just finding it's impossible to get a work-life balance? That's, um, you know, that's what we need to be investigating. Flexibility is often a big issue, isn't it? And I bet if we get flexible working practices, I know it's not always easy, but um, that's a big, big factor, I think. And Sally? Yeah. Um, uh, Jane, it, it, with um, vacancies, uh, from my understanding, I mean, and I'm talking about nursing vacancies in particular here, but to, yeah, and also AHPs, it's important to get a pipeline. And I'm, I, I, it may be too long a question this, but I, at some point I'd be really interested in terms of what the strength of our links with the local universities and also what we do to actually engage with the students while they're, they're here and, and perhaps if they've got a majority of their placements with us, how we can then towards the end of their training promise them a, 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 a post with our interview providing that they've passed all their placements you, you, just to ensure because that's our biggest group isn't it the, the people who come and do the training with us and how we actually capture them early on. Yeah, that's such a good point, um, Sally. And one of our big concerns is that we don't capture as many of the students as we would like to. Um, our main university um, for nursing is University of West London. Um, sadly, University of West London only filled half of its places at its Reading campus this year, um, which is a big blow to us because, um, you know, of 100, I think just over 100 students we were supposed to have, um, we've only managed, you know, they've only managed to recruit 50. Um, we do know that all of the AHP courses um, in local universities were in clearing um, and that the apprenticeship places are uh, so universities that are offering apprenticeships um, are bursting at the seams for apprenticeships but not for direct entrance um, so yeah I can I can talk a long time about pipeline um, yeah. we're, we're certainly as you know and with thanks to finance investing more in apprenticeships um, and we've got a steady program going on there. In fact, we just discussed um, how we're going to use the remainder of our funding to encourage um, more apprenticeships, particularly in the AHP area um, and using um, uh, T-level students. One of the things, one of the options that we are currently also exploring is um, do we want to do some sort of recruitment and retention well, premium to try and encourage more students to come and join us. Um, but that's a, an ongoing um, paper at the moment that we're, we're looking at. But yeah, absolutely also agree. Um, we're we're behind the curve in that we ask people to apply um, when they're so we ask students to apply for a role with us when actually most um, organisations are now offering people a, a, a role, you know, a year, two years, you know, before they actually join. Yeah, they um, do. And so have lots of conversations with the students that, you know, while they're going through. 
Yeah, so we, we've got and that's something we're also um, addressing as as we speak, because currently the way that our finance processes work is that we uh, and sorry, this is not finance because finance are trying to help us solve the problem. But the way the, the system works at the moment, we have to offer against a vacancy. And of course, if it's a year down the line, we don't have a vacancy. Um, so that's something that you know, we're, we're focused on with our finance colleagues. So who we also are, are, are supportive about trying to get that, that process changed. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. I, I, I'm sure we need to look hard at some of these things that get in the way, like some of these rules. You know, we've, we've got to, just as uh, universities have to act very quickly to get students into their uh, university, we have to act, as Sally says, I think, in a innovative ways to keep students with us while they're training. Alex. Jane, I just think it's worth profiling some of the learning we're doing around international recruitment because we are pushing ahead as a community service provider, particularly in trying to recruit international nurses into community nursing, for example, uh, and just, just to bring up to speed some of the learning we're doing around that and how yeah. we might need to flex. OK, so yeah, um, the international recruitment program has worked um, in that we are beginning to get um, physical health nurses um, and we're expanding into AHPs. Um, we initially um, have been putting our nurses onto wards um, and we had a couple that we have trialled in the community. Um, at the moment, we're pausing the community um, recruitment because the issue that we're facing is is transport. Those community nurses um, will need a car um, and they're struggling to be able to uh, access transport. And um, we can't, you know, we're, we're struggling to get pool cars for them, all sorts of, of issues that we're hitting there. So what we're going to be doing instead is um, we're looking at an A3 that's at the originally the problem we were trying to solve by putting in international nurses in, into community was the fact that we um, had gaps in our community nursing um, you know, and, and struggled to recruit at times into community nursing. So we're going to go back and have a rethink about what do we need to do to make community a viable option either for an international nurse or a more attractive option for our new students or our, or, or our existing staff and doing an A3 piece of work and the money that we had going we were going to use to look at community nursing and we'll probably divert um, that funding our internal funding more towards AHP um, international AHP recruitment which is um, a, equally a, a you know a, a concern but where we think we can find um, good um, you know, good, good international staff for that. And Debbie has shared that we're we're not the only trust in this position in terms of trying to scope for community posts. Um, other community providers are having similar issues. Yeah, so yeah. the sort of things. Sorry, but Debbie. Sorry, I was just going to say, so it, it's not as simple as if we had poor cars, all would be good. So, you know, there's huge lengthy wait lists now for um, for driving tests. So um, people can only use their international driving license for a period of time and then they need to have a British one and they need to have passed a test to do that. So, um, you know, we've got people that haven't even got as far as taking a driving test. So a poor car is not going to is not going to help in that situation. Um, and when I've talked to other colleagues, they are experiencing the same sort of challenges and are also seeing quite a lot of international recruits that are placed in the community gravitating back to acute trusts after six to eight, six to 12 months, because that is where their experience generally is. Very few international um, nurses have any experience in community nursing or understanding of it because it, it just isn't a specialism that is in many countries and therefore what they know and love is acute trusts and therefore as jobs come up in acute trusts so so there is also a danger that we spend a lot of time putting a lot of time effort commitment into into this um, and then when they're skilled up they move back to an acute trust so I, I think we do need to think really carefully about whether international recruitment for community nursing posts is the right way forward. Yeah, and and hence for why lots we, of reasons. Yeah, and hence why we want to step back and have a rethink, not throw you know money at this problem, but really look at what the problem is. And we're very hopeful that there is a master's program going to be running on our patch. Um, I think it's University of West London that's um, running that as well for community nursing and we are um, engaged in taking, we will, we're engaged with that and we will be taking students from that um, to train and um, hoping to recruit 
directly from that as well. But yeah, there is um, a rethink going on around what we need to do around the community. Thank you. Any other questions? Mark. Yeah, Jane, when we spoke a couple of years ago on the subject at the board, um, one of the areas that required attention was that of recruitment, both in terms of the ease with which a potential candidate can apply, but also the speed with which we can process those applications and get an offer out to those people and not lose good candidates. How comfortable are you with the improvements that have been made to the recruitment process over that period of time? Yeah, OK, Mark. Um, so our, our before COVID, our average time to recruit was 35 days. We went um, it, we went way above that. Um, um, as you know, uh, you know, uh, we, we did have a, a, a significant problem in that area. We have now managed to clear the backlog and we're down to 40 days as the average day time to recruit. Now, that's with out increasing the numbers of people in the team, but actually having had higher numbers of vacancies. And part of the reason we've been able to do that is because of the business process improvement work that we've been um, taking forward with the IT team. Um, so um, that work continues. We've hit a couple of roadblocks in terms of um, uh, you know things like procurement data um you know making sure that we keep our data safe um um you know where where we've been looking to to um outsource a few bits and pieces that could or could be done you know simpler with another partner um but the internal you know, work continues to progress and we continue to look at how we can um take away what I would call the non-value adding work and, and roboticize a lot of that um, non-value adding work. Um, yeah, and we've got a big program of work um, with um, with the IT team that are taking that forward. So that is that's really helping us. For example, we now uh, if you want to um, so now every candidate who is invited into um, interview is invited by a, a, a robot. The robot does all that um, allocating into diaries. And we worked out that that saves us um, that, that, you know, that saves us you know, a significant amount of time. So it, it works out around um, uh, 30 hours a month that we save um, by having um, a robot do that piece of work. That's good to hear. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Jane, uh, thank you very much. I mean, this is clearly a, a key issue. You know, workforce is our top uh, risk on our on our board assurance framework, and I'm sure it is for every trust in the country. Um, I think it's one of these things where it's going to be again a sort of multi-pronged approach, isn't it? With international apprenticeships, retention, um, and I, I, whilst I welcome very much international recruitment and the apprenticeships. I think it'd be interesting to, to not now, but at some point just to come back to us to help us understand which of these is the most uh, likely to deliver um, uh, solutions. Because if we're losing a lot of staff on ret the retention, perhaps is the biggest thing. If it's not that in its international recruitment, the numbers going up, although they're quite small at the moment, um, that's it. So I'm not, 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 not trying to engender discussion now, but I think, you know, that's this complexity of the world we're in. And the universities, very bad news, are universities are, are having not enough students applying. And that's probably, as you say, because the apprenticeships are seen as a route, you know, more financially viable route for the students. And yet that isn't really properly embedded yet. So, you know, it's a transition period we're in. It's pretty complex. But thank yeah. you to you. Thank you to you and your team. Yeah, no, no problem. I'm very happy to come back and you know, talk through that workforce model if you think that will be helpful um, and to talk about, you know, um, what that that workforce plan starts yeah, to look it, like. It may, it may be in terms of detail, I expect FIT will probably want to have a look at some point of that, but I think we it's such a big issue. You need to come back in you know, a few months and we can decide when's appropriate so we can understand how things are going. But yeah, thank you very much, Jane, for that. No, no problems at all. Thank you. That's great. Um, very clear presentation too. Okay, can we move on to 9.1, quality, quarterly status report and key activities, Alex? Thanks, Martin. So broadly to note, I'll just highlight the two projects rated red, uh, one of which is the redevelopment of East Berkshire Community Hospitals. This is a Frimley ICS initiative uh, and is red rated because of our view around feasibility and affordability. Uh, we're supporting uh, the outline business case development, but given the capital constraints nationally, it's quite likely um, we're not going to be able to proceed in the system on the basis of the original business cases. 
and so I know the system is looking at what the plan B's will will be to get the uh, the integrated hubs up and running across East Berkshire. Uh, and then a resource issue around this, the children and young people and families referral management system. Should we expect to resolve that uh, referral management system needs refreshing uh, for its current service portfolio? Uh, and then just to highlight some new initiatives on page uh, nine of that report, 159 in the pack, uh, the Barch Healthcare One team, which is Tamina's programme around a fit for the future core community mental health service. Uh, and how that works and operates across the trust and with, with our partner uh, deliverers. Operation Courage, uh, delighted to just to confirm here in public, we were awarded the lead contract position for the Veterans Mental Health and Wellbeing Services across the South East region, working in close partnership with Sussex Partnership Mental Health Trust and a range of third uh, sector and voluntary organisations, including Walking with the Wounded, uh, we're identifying this as mission critical. We've done some important learning from other geographical expansions in terms of making sure we're embedding culture, operational protocols, transitioning new teams in, um, in, in a way that really properly integrates into our culture and operation as a trust. Uh, and so that's a mission critical piece of work to do that very well. And an agreement around the implementation of the neurodiversity strategy, strong support in the organisation around raising awareness, education of neurodiverse people's needs, both from a staff perspective uh, and across our services, understanding neurodiversity so that we don't get a siloed approach or a misunderstanding approach about people's needs coming through our system. So just wanted to highlight those things. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Alex. Any questions? No? OK, Alex, thanks very much and thanks for the positive uh, report. Uh, trust seal, Paul. I always love the trust seal one because there's a Victorian feel about it. But, uh... Yeah, uh, so it took a lot of time to pull the report together, so if I just take you through the high points. Um, just joking, uh, obviously the summary report just uh, says what his uh, seal came yeah. out. Um, assigned to the um, Adlam Villas development in Newbury, which is going to provide expanded MSK space. OK, thank you for that. 10.1, um, new code of governance for NHS providers. Julie. Yeah, this is just an assurance paper. The NHS England brought out a new code of governance in October and I've self-assessed the trust against the, the new code. There's very, it's very much a sort of tidying up exercise, so there's no no real um, particular difference between between the old code. code. It's just updated. So, so okay. if anyone's got any questions. We did have a chance to, well, I had a chance anyway to comment on it, but I didn't, uh, it's, as you say, it's a tidying up rather than a major change. We're content. Can we go on to 10.2, trust constitutional changes? Now, this is something where we need to decide. Yeah, we take, um, we ask our trust solicitors every three to four years to review the constitution to make sure that it's still compliant with any new legislation, that it reflects good practice. And we recently um, conducted this exercise. Again, it, this is a tidying up exercise. The only particular changes are we've introduced a new process for reviewing any excluded members we we have in which reflects our process for vexatious complainants and we've made it a bit more explicit that meetings can be held in person virtually or hybrid and we I'd like to put on record my thanks to the a small group of governors who helped me to go through the constitution and to make um, to make some changes that was really helpful and the Council of Governors last week looked at the changes and approved them because it has to be approved by both the Council of Governors and by the Trust Board. So, are there any questions before I ask if you can approve? Everyone happy to approve? OK, thank you very much. You've got that, uh, Julie. Um, Council of Governors update. I don't think I've got anything particular apart because Julie's covered it. So, um, unless anyone have got any questions, I'll... I'll move on. OK. Any other business? All right, date of the next public board meeting, the 14th of February, um, 23. Heavens, how time flies. Now, we've got some observers, and uh, 
if it was a, a face to face meeting, we'll invite observers if they have any questions for a few minutes to 